Welcome to STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. Hello. I'm your co-host, Marcus Bauman, a senior research scientist at IHMC. Joining me to introduce today's podcast is the man behind the curtain, Dr. Ken Ford, IHMC's director and chairman of the Double Secret Selection Committee that selects all the guests who appear on STEM Talk. Hello, Marcus. Good to be here. Today, we have Dr. Sten Stray Gunderson, a postdoctoral research associate at the University of South Carolina and an adjunct instructor at the university's Arnold School of Public Health. Sten's research focuses on cardiovascular exercise physiology with a special emphasis on hypoxia, blood flow restriction training, and endothelial function. Prior to his position at South Carolina, Sten was at the University of Texas in Austin where he earned his PhD as well as his master's degree. During his time in Austin, he also worked as an exercise physiologist and blood flow restriction training specialist. Sten's father, Jim, was our guest on episode 34 of STEM Talk back in 2017. Jim, who passed away last year, helped pioneer blood flow restriction training in the United States. In today's episode, we talked to Sten about the documented benefits of blood flow restriction, which include not only increases in muscle size and strength, but also improved endurance, as well as reduced risk of injury. But before we get to our interview with Sten, we have some housekeeping to take care of. First, we appreciate all of you who have subscribed to STEM Talk, and we are especially appreciative of all the wonderful five-star reviews. As always, the Double Secret Selection Committee has been continually and carefully reviewing iTunes, Google, Stitcher, and other podcast apps for their wittiest and most lavishly praise-filled reviews to read on STEM Talk. If you hear your review read on STEM Talk, just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk t-shirt. Today, our winning review was posted by someone who goes by the moniker Lily's Mom. The review is titled, Thank You. It reads, Thank you so much for the Chris McCurdy interview. I've been interested in Kratom and its potential to help with pain relief, but I kept reading warnings from the FDA about Kratom. Your discussion with Dr. McCurdy helped me wade through these concerns. Thank you, and keep up the good work. Thank you, Lily's mom, and thanks to all our other STEM Talk listeners who have helped make STEM Talk such a great success. Okay, and now on to today's interview with Dr. Sten Stray Gunderson. STEM Talk. 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 Hello, welcome to STEM Talk. I'm your host, Marcus Bauman, and joining us today is Sten Stray Gunderson. And also joining us is Ken Ford. Hello, Marcus, and hello, Sten. Hello. So, Sten, where did you grow up? Uh, moved around a lot, actually. Uh, that's a good question. I was born in Dallas, Texas, till about the age of four. We moved to Oslo, Norway, part of my dad's plan to sort of expose the kids to as much as possible. From there, my, uh, my mom thought we were becoming a little bit too, too Norwegian, and they wanted us to make sure that we maintained our English well. So we moved back to the States in the form of Park City, Utah. We spent about four years there, and through fate kind of guiding everything, we ended up back in Dallas for my high school years. I understand you were quite the soccer player in high school. Is it true that you helped lead your soccer team to three straight state titles? Yes, sir. That's correct. Uh, we were part of a uh, very good high school soccer team under the tutelage of Tattoo Pecorori, a very good friend of mine now. One thing to mention here is that high school was sort of the, the fun part of, of the soccer experience in high school. Uh, it was really the travel and academy soccer where it was sort of the real season and allowed for opportunities to be seen by college coaches, among others. I also ran track and cross country and was a dis decent mid-distance runner, which ended up serving me well during my college soccer career. Yeah, I would say mid-distance runner is almost perfect for soccer preparation. Your younger brother was also quite good at uh, soccer as well. And when you were a senior, he was a freshman, played with you on the team that won its third straight state championship. Did the two of you grow up playing soccer together? Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's one of my highlights of my soccer career. You sort of gain a special advantage and connection out there being related. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention my older brother as well. All three of us played soccer and were intimately competitive, uh, sometimes to my mother's chagrin. But it was a really good atmosphere to develop skills and develop that competitive spirit. I understand that soccer wasn't the only sport that you excelled at. You are also a nationally ranked speed skater and cross-country skier as a teenager. Is that right? Can you tell us a little about that? 
Sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, my whole family was very sports centric. My dad made sure of that. And my mom definitely helped along the way. And, you know, every kid within the family took a very professional approach to their sport. I was nationally ranked as a speed skater. We ended up having a NORAM competition where I was sort of in the top one or two in the States. The Canadians seemed to out, out skate us for most of the, most of the time. I also was a sort of top 10 cross country skier as a teenager as well. And actually, when we moved to Dallas, I ended up commuting back and forth between Park City, Utah and Dallas, Texas. And then in order to acclimatize for that, I uh, ended up living in an altitude tent as a teenager, which was an interesting, uh, interesting way to live at that time. Um, I would sleep in there and I would study in there. I was sort of, um, we'll get to this in a little bit, but I was sort of a guinea pig for my dad, sort of testing out his high-low training. And it actually worked quite well, I have to say. That's actually very, very interesting. I look forward to hearing a little bit more about that. I suspect both of your folks uh, played major roles in helping you excel in athletics. Is that right? Absolutely. And all the kids in the family felt really privileged to have, you know, a world-class coach and scientist as a father. And as I mentioned, kind of acted as willing guinea pigs. Again, I'd be remiss, though, if I didn't mention my mom. She was there at every turn, you know, took the advice of my father, had us on good nutrition, making sure to fuel our respective sports and allow for any opportunity to kind of be taken advantage of. And within, within this framework, you know, the kids were the priority. The kids' performances were the priority. But we never felt pressure from either of my parents to excel for their sake. It was simply to give us a chance to optimize our lives and our output. I and, mean, you know, this, this relates to my dad's anti-doping work, you know, in a lot of ways it was fueled by the idea that his children would be able to compete in a fair world if they so choose. That quality is sort of innate within him. It certainly was. And I was very sorry to hear about your father's passing away last year. He was a remarkable man, and I considered him a friend. His interview on episode number 34 about blood flow restriction back in 2017 is still a really popular episode. Yeah, you know, it, it has been a monumental loss to our family and, and honestly, the greater sports and scientific community. You know, having said that, it's been a gracious and humbling experience uh, hearing from, uh, you know, many es highly esteemed individuals such as yourself. Not only note the impact that he's had on sport and performance, but speak to the person that he was. And, you know, I, I take that very seriously and, and, um, and profoundly try to live out, you know, the way that he envisioned um, our lives to go. So, um, you know, one, one quick anecdote to kind of give an idea of, of him as a person, uh, you know, he took life very seriously and literally, and we, you know, definitely employed that when raising his children. Uh, one funny, funny memory uh, or a story that he once told me was when his dad left the house traveling for work, his dad let him know, hey, you're the man of the house now. Uh, he ended up, he proceeded to take his father's clothes and shoes and cigar and told his mother to make him a drink. Uh, I presume in jest, but uh, I don't think my grandmother took it as lighthearted as it <laughs> was intended. <laughs> oh boy, that's a good one. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah. You know, the other thing is I had a, a front row seat being around some of the best of the best athletes and military personnel seeing the the sacrifice that they were willing to make and, and the eking out the little extra percentage um, in order to achieve their goals. So it was uh, quite quite a, a privileged childhood in, in terms of that. Just sounds absolutely fantastic. A lot of information to absorb and interpret and learn from and absolutely. just sounds fantastic. So earlier you talked about being a guinea pig. I hear mm -hmm. you were a senior in high school when your father first got you to try blood flow restriction understand you have a pretty interesting story about that, how that came about. Yeah, you know, uh, and if memory serves, I, I think it was actually maybe my sophomore year or maybe my freshman year of college. We had come back for Christmas break and my dad has these weird straps in this, at the time, a very uh, professional looking suitcase. At the time, it was the Katsu Master. So some of you may know what I'm talking about is this silver sort of suitcase looking thing. It's pretty mm -hmm. cool. And he exposed us to this and, you know, said, initially we were all very skeptical including him but he said you know let's let's try this out let's see if you know all the hubbub is there's something to that and very in very short order we started seeing the effects not only in terms of performance but even in terms of recovery so you know in particular coming out of a, a fall season of playing soccer it was a great way to maintain the fitness but also allow me to go you know skiing or or do other sports and then come back and kind of do more sports specific stuff with the bands and sort of minimally load but but also maintain throughout that off season so Given that experience and, and all the others that you mentioned with your father, when did you first become really interested in science as a pursuit? 
Yeah, you know, I, I was always interested in what my father was doing, and he would often explain every minute detail about a, a given topic. He had a way of explaining things that sort of made you want to understand it like he did. I had a slightly different process for my father, you know, kind of going back and listening to his STEM talk was very interesting and actually uh, introduced me to some things I didn't realize before. But, you know, I think fundamentally, I was just so interested in the process of exercise training, which sort of opened up the underlying mechanisms at play and really pursuing that 0.01% advantage, but importantly, do it in a fair way, but sort of leverage the physiology to your the, the specific uh, demands of a given sport. You ended up at Dartmouth College after high school on a soccer scholarship. After graduating, I understand that you attempted to play in the USL. How did that go? Well, in short, not too well. Uh, I was a, a, a good soccer player, sort of on the threshold of becoming pro, trying to make decisions based on that. And things didn't just didn't seem to fall into place for me. Right after my senior season, which is in the fall, I had a terrific senior season, captained the team and had a really good shot of going. Turns out the preseason for, for USL or MLS uh, happens in sort of February, maybe even March. I ended up having a non-sports related concussion, which sort of took me out of that that year. Um, so anyway, I, I ended up going home, recovering, and uh, trying out the, the following year. And the way that this sort of works is you can either get picked up at a combine or you sort of have maybe a friend that you know or a coach that you know who is connected with a given team. And then you can kind of go and play during their preseason because they need they need bodies. And so the idea of, was to sort of break into the team um, and show well. I ended up showing well, but there was not a spot for me on that particular team. In between jumping around different teams, I was actually playing in a recreational men's soccer league to sort of stay fit or keep my touch touch up and uh, ended up blowing out my knee. Someone who had probably no business being out there had a very, very late tackle as I was shooting. I hit the ball first. They hit my foot after and had a, a pretty severe MCL tear after that. So again, you know, not too well, but, uh, but it, it, it opened up other uh, opportunities down the road. So it sounds like as the injuries piled up, and as you talked about a little bit earlier, you became fascinated by the underlying physiology at play. So after many uh, discussions with your dad, late night talks, you started to think about going back to school to pursue research. What was your thinking in, in making those decisions? Yeah, to be honest, I, uh, you know, as, as is often with people, uh, you have sort of a one track mind for your goal. And I felt that uh, if I could play soccer for you know a few years at the professional level, I could kind of figure it out from there. At the same time, I was very, very interested in physiology. I got a biology degree from Dartmouth and had a growing interest in, in sort of the, like I said, the underlying physiology. And it really was BFR that sort of sparked that initial interest into perhaps the research side of things to truly understand what was going on here. You know, in particular, when I tore my MCL, we had a very aggressive BFR and rehab plan. I was sort of on the threshold for going into surgery or not. We opted to not go into surgery. And so within uh, actually a five-week period of having a grade three MCL tear, various other issues with my meniscus, in about five weeks, I was actually running at full body weight. At six weeks, I was cutting. And at eight weeks, I was actually able to kick the ball and play in that sort of way. All at the same time, not losing a whole lot of fitness because I was training pretty hard multiple times a day with BFR. So all of these things really sparked the bulb of what can I do with my interests and how can I have a positive impact on the world in this way? So that sort of brought me down to UT Austin um, in Texas under the mentorship of Hiro Tanaka and the rest is sort of history. Yeah, so while you were at Texas for both your master's and your doctorate, which you just completed recently, you also, during your time in Austin, went to work for a group called ROI Performance, which is an advanced physical therapy that uses science-based approaches to athletic rehab and performance. Can you talk a little bit about the work you did at ROI and particularly the BFR work as a blood flow restriction specialist? Yes, absolutely. ROI was a big part of my life in Austin. And actually, what's what's really cool is a really cool opportunity to sort of start a performance center from the ground up. So I was there, I was one of the oldest employees at the time when I moved, and we actually came up with just about every aspect of this performance center from the infrastructure to the equipment that was uh, was ordered to the methodology that was implemented. And it's it's really cool to see how, how far it's come in, in a three or four years. In particular, my expertise was sort of leveraged to inform the blood flow restriction training, which is sort of uh, novel in terms of athletic performance. The whole idea was to have an environment or infrastructure where we had 
physical therapy and strength conditioning, as well as other for performance tests and other recovery methodologies to actually allow an athlete who is either at the pro level, youth level, or anywhere in between to come in and have sort of a one, one stop shop for all of their needs. And so uh, again, blood flow restriction was a critical piece of, to that as far as a rehab scenario, but also it provided good fodder for implementation of BFR for athletic performance. And, you know, I, I encourage everybody in Austin who's looking for a performance center of that sort to go check them out. They do really, really good work and have worked with a, a number of professional athletes and youth athletes in the area. So let's pause right here and give listeners a brief primer on blood flow restriction, which involves restricting the flow of blood to specific muscle groups using specialized cuffs or bands. Sten, can you explain for the listeners how blood flow restriction training allows people to train with lighter weights while still achieving many of the benefits associated with more traditional, heavier resistance training? Yeah. So, you know, fundamentally, the way I think about BFR is you're eliciting a profound disturbance in homeostasis that is associated with this exercise stimulus. And this stimulates adaptive mechanisms to enhance a given system's ability to prevent or mitigate future disturbances in homeostasis. So that's a lot of technical jargon to essentially say, you know, performing this relatively light exercise or light intensity exercise under the context of blood flow restriction can elicit adaptations normally associated with high intensity or high load exercise. Blood flow restriction training began with a resistance training focus, very much so. But recently, there's been increased attention placed on aerobic training as well. Can you discuss how different protocols of blood flow restriction training can be implemented to give a desired effect, whether it be for endurance and aerobic or a resistance training effect? Yeah, you know, I think it's, it's important to review the traditional stimuli that are involved with both resistance training and aerobic training. You know, one way to conceptualize the resistance side of things is, you know, sort of four main stimuli. We have mechanical stress, we have metabolic stress, we have a certain degree of muscle damage, and we have rapid or eventual recruitment of high threshold motor units. And all of these things sort of have particular impacts that result in adaptation. And in particular, BFR really ramps up the metabolic stress variable of that equation, which has been shown to elicit increases in muscle size and hypertrophy. So as you mentioned, you know, it kind of started out as this resistance training focus, which I think was a result of who was studying it and sort of who developed the technique originally. But more emphasis has been placed on aerobic fitness as well. In particular, I think this is a result of BFR being implemented for more clinical populations in some cases, as well as athletes. But, you know, in particular, the aerobic fitness is, is important for aging populations, as is muscle mass. And so there has been a shift. So even, even just three days a week for eight weeks of, of walking at a reasonable pace, you know, for those out there, three miles an hour or four to six kilometers an hour, whether that's at a 1% or a 5% grade is typically what we see with aerobic training with BFR. Now that can look different for trained individuals versus untrained individuals. But again, this is sort of the focus has sort of shifted to a more moderate or very trivial type walking exercise. These paces are, are otherwise trivial, but when we have bands on and we're restricting blood flow, they can actually elicit increases in VO2 max, you know, and we can maybe talk about some of the stimuli for aerobic training as well. You know, typically we have the main adaptation from aerobic training is an increase in stroke volume, which can be influenced by blood volume changes and more long-term structural changes and functional changes to the heart. We also have the sort of peripheral side of things where we have increases in hemoglobin and hematocrit, capitalization within the muscle fiber, increases in mitochondrial biodensity. And it appears that the low oxygen, low pH, highest, highly acidic environment on top of this reduction in venous return, which we'll get into here in a minute, also has the potential and has been shown to stimulate increases in aerobic fitness, whether that's on the uh, purely the VO2 side or even the running uh, or the economy of motion side as well. So that's sort of to summarize sort of the new focus on more aerobic training with regards to BFR. Although much of the Western research on blood flow restriction training has now incorporated the AOP approach, so much so that it's often promoted as the only safe and effective approach to BFR, it is important to note that this is not how BFR began, nor was the original intention to occlude arterial flow. The size, the material, and the width of the cuff or band certainly matters. While there are many ways to skin a cat, there are trade-offs associated with a variety of approaches. 
please discuss this in some detail as these important issues are often overlooked or sort of just swept under the rug. Sure. Yeah. You know, I think this is somewhat of a product of having these things easily accessible in the lab. You know, it's often very common to see a Hokanson cuff or other blood pressure cuff surgical tourniquet within a lab. Not only that, but it is nice to have numbers associated with various pressures that then you can sort of tweak and and change to study them a little bit better to to truly understand the impact of what the pressure stimulus is doing. But to your point, you know, this was not how this originally developed in Japan. As a matter of fact, it was truly the main goal was to elicit a more rapid onset of fatigue. And to your point, the size, material, width of the cuff or band matters. And some of those trade-offs might be, you know, discomfort. Some of those trade-offs might be feasibility with certain activities, you know, potentials for a higher risk of a cardiovascular response, perhaps in some cases, a higher pressure associated with less total work. So, you know, there's no, there's no one right answer. Although I think, you know, it's important to not only mention the differences in the potential physiological effects, but also the practicality and the feasibility are important if BFR is to become more widespread and apply to a larger variety of populations and activities. So, you know, with that being said, I think there are certain cuffs that would be appropriate for certain populations and certain activities, while other cuffs might be appropriate in more of a controlled lab setting and or a physical therapy setting. The conclusion of all that in my mind is that we need to study all of them, but we do need to be very clear about what we're studying and what specific uh, protocols we're following uh, within that, within that vein. Yes, the need for clarity is lacking in a lot of blood flow restriction papers and research. I'm sure some of it is good research, but I, I can't learn a lot from some of the papers because the protocols are all over the place and the equipment is all different. Yes, absolutely. And again, there's very strong evidence to suggest that multiple forms of this BFR work. But I'd like, you know, to have a call for more specific terminology about what exactly we're doing. And I think that will help elucidate whether we can expect different responses when using different cuffs or different protocols. And, you know, in the feasible, as I mentioned, the practicality of actually using this in the real world, you know, when we're in a lab environment, it's important to isolate variables. And it's important to, you know, make sure that we're titrating the exact same stimulus for the for the given participant. But we also need to reflect how these will be used so that we can interpret those results and actually apply them in the real world. Yes, indeed. So, Stan, we've discussed a little bit earlier some of the many mechanisms that have been proposed to explain the positive effects we see with blood flow restriction training. Could you elaborate a little more on that, especially with regard to resistance training? And what's the current best thinking on the mechanism of action in that regard? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, again, fundamentally, the idea behind adaptation to exercise is to improve a system that is currently limiting performance. So this sort of takes different shapes based on the uh, specific sport you're talking about. But fundamentally, BFR is accelerating fatigue and really ramping up the metabolic stress associated with a given exercise to a high degree, which taps into the existing mechanisms associated with those with less absolute stress. But again, there's no free lunch here. There's a high degree of relative stress, which is really, we believe, fundamental and and very crucial for the proper adaptation from BFR. So as I mentioned before, we can kind of think of those four main stimuli, mechanical, metabolic stress muscle damage, and high threshold motor unit recruitment as the main stimuli for causing adaptation in the muscle in both size and strength. With BFR, you know, you're having a mild to low mechanical stress, depending on not only the weight that you're moving, but also time under tension. And as fibers begin to fatigue, perhaps there's more mechanical tension placed on uh, the remaining fibers until a point where you're recruiting the entire muscle and all of the populations of fibers within that muscle. Again, there's a high degree of metabolic stress. What I mean by that is a buildup of the byproducts of muscle contraction, the byproducts of producing ATP. You know, we can kind of think about this in terms of lactate and hydrogen ions, which serve to lower the pH. We also get a, a degree of hypoxia, which can stimulate some angiogenic responses. But also, I think what is critical here and what is typically associated with muscle hypertrophy is this recruitment of of type 2X or type 2B fibers, which are innervated by these high threshold motor units, which normally are only recruited under either a heavy load or an exercise taken to approximate failure. 
And with BFR, you're sort of accelerating that process of taking it to failure or, or a high degree of fatigue. And so you gradually recruit those muscle fibers, which then gives them the ability to adapt from that stimulus. And so, you know, in some ways, BFR is not a large deviation from the normal exercise response. We're sort of just getting to that sweet spot. So sort of, um, I call it the, the zone of proximal development in a rapid way compared to the same exercise without blood flow restriction. So given that there is sort of a more rapid increase in type 2 motor unit recruitment, and that leads potentially to part of the sort of more rapid adaptations associated with BFR training, you know, there's this sort of new, well, maybe, maybe new is not the best term, but there is certainly elevated interest in lactate as one of the many exerkines. George Brooks and others have put forward a number of hypotheses on this, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. You mentioned lactate as one of the metabolic stimuli, and we now think that lactate may actually be driving some interesting processes that upregulate various growth factors and things. I found it interesting that, you know, BFR ramps up lactate production. Big time. Um, Lactate itself is now thought to do things like stimulate cells to make growth factors like BDNF. So at, with higher intensity contraction and, and a higher intensity metabolic load, part of the reason that we think higher intensity training and BFR is a way of getting there might be of benefit for things that have a threshold. For example, BDNF stimulation of the brain. It's actually a really interesting new direction and makes me think about sort of re, re-emphasizing the need to recruit the type 2 motor units, regardless of the type of exercise you're doing, and if BFR is a way of getting at that quicker. Yes. Um- you all might recall uh, Art Devaney. He's like, I think he's 87 currently. When he spoke last at IHMC, he was 86. And uh, he's totally focused on lactate and thinks, you know, is really excited about the new research with respect to lactate, and particularly as it relates to aging population and brain health as well as muscle. And for him, you know, at 87, this kind of thing is pretty exciting. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, Maybe it's too much of a deviation here, I don't know, but I, I find it interesting that we've always looked at lactate as, it's a biomarker of intensity, right? It's a metabolic byproduct. We say if it goes up, the intensity was high, but now it's beyond that. If lactate accumulation is actually stimulating the production and secretion of growth factors and other things that may travel and influence other organs, it's really interesting. Yes. In fact, I spoke to uh, Jim uh, Strang Gunderson about this a little bit when we were wondering about the systemic effects, you know, the non-local effects, what could be accounting for that? And I'm sure Sten will have more to say about that, but that was one of the ideas, not the only idea, but it was one of the ideas that came up. Yeah. You know, I think, again, I I don't want to kind of speak out of turn here. It sounds, I mean, it sounds like a very interesting topic that I need to dig into more, to be honest with you, with, with you guys bringing this up. You know, what I'll say is we, you know, we've kind of always thought about lactate or lactic acid as, you know, the thing that causes muscle soreness. And so it's, it is interesting to see the evolution, not only from sort of that myth of lactic acid causing muscle soreness, but now the potential impact of lactate in and of itself in producing these systemic effects. I certainly you know, can see the impact of exercise in general, but specifically blood flow restriction, because you're all, you are able to get to that high intensity with relatively light loads as impacting cognition as well. And to your point, BDNF has, has kind of gained notoriety or, or has increased popularity as far as, you know, making the brain more plastic and improving a variety of, of cognitive measures. So I think more we, more work needs to be done, both in the literature, but also on my end and, and looking into that. Now that I'm kind of here, and we can talk about this later on, but at USC, you know, the focus is more on the endocrine side. Um, and so that's definitely uh, uh, an avenue I'd like to investigate. So I imagine there are differences in approach between an elite athlete aiming to gain a fractional advantage versus a middle-aged or older adult aiming to incorporate BFR as a staple or a replacement for other forms of training. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, th- I think it's important to delineate that difference because a lot of the times these things can sort of get melted together. And when we kind of talk about the adaptations from exercise in a elite athlete context versus the benefits to fitness and overall well-being in someone who is, you know, just trying to stay fit and improve their health span, I think there's there's subtle differences there. So, you know, for an athlete, we're really, um, you know, a given program is designed to specifically cause one aspect of that athlete to adapt and improve performance. And so 
BFR can sort of be titrated in to help move that endeavor forward. This is the case with a lot of you know, anaerobic athletes, I think, have, have a really cool application of BFR in prolonging or extending their ability to perform anaerobic work. You know, that is probably the most similar in terms of the feelings that are elicited from BFR within those more anaerobic type sports. But there's also an application for, you know, longer distance type athletes where, you know, maybe they don't want to be lifting a lot of weights. They don't want to be sore for their training sessions, but the strength aspect is actually very important, particularly towards the end of a given race. You know, also on the other end of the spectrum with, you know, power lifters or highly explosive athletes, you could see the the advantage of using BFR as perhaps a sort of a cap uh, or a polishing of, uh, off of their normal weight training to make sure that they're able to mitigate increases in metabolic stress associated with their sport while also making sure they do lift heavy weights in uh, to maximize their performance in their specific sport. On the other side of things, we have the sort of baby boomer population, the, the middle-aged population, which you know, are kind of looking for the minimal effective dose, if you will, to make sure that they are maximizing their health span and and staying fit so that they're able to, you know, play with their kids. They're able to go do activities that may require a little bit higher fitness than the average person. And in a lot of ways that this can provide a complete replacement or sort of a 90% replacement of their of their normal strength training or aerobic training, I do think that having that 10% of mechanical loading or sport-specific movements for a given activity are important. And the way I see BFR is sort of a way to augment the normal responses to those to those training sessions rather than a complete replacement. Having said that, I do think that BFR can be used in periods of maintenance very, very well in, in periods where you're traveling a lot, where maybe you don't have access to gym equipment or you don't have access to areas where you're going to be able to have these high intensity sessions. BFR is a great thing to kind of have on the road to make sure that you're not uh, falling behind. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research organization investigating a broad range of topics aimed at understanding and extending human cognition, locomotion, health span, resilience, and performance. A little later, we will discuss how people who are interested in BFR training might get started. But first, let's dive into some of the studies and the papers that you've worked on the past few years. While you were at Texas, you had an interesting study that compared the acute cardiovascular responses to two distinct forms of blood flow restriction training during light intensity exercise. In this case, the exercise was walking. As you note in the paper, blood flow restriction training has become quite popular over the past two decades. But there's been some concern over the use of blood flow restriction in at-risk populations. So first, what are the concerns? Sure, yeah. You know, there's this paper that came out in 2015 that had a call for concern regarding the an excessive exercise pressure response. And this was particularly relevant for clinical populations who have a high cardiovascular disease risk, as well as lifters who are sort of notorious for consuming high amounts of caffeine or other stimulants for training. And it was thought that the exercise pressure reflex, which is a sympathetically mediated response to increases in exercise intensity, increases in mechano and metaboreceptor stimulation. And this may predispose somebody who is already at risk to developing a cardiovascular issue. What's interesting is, you know, in Japan, this has been going on for many, many years and used by athletes as well as senior citizens to actually have a beneficial effect on the cardiovascular system. And so really what our paper was trying to address is, is this sort of deviation from the way that this was implemented and designed in Japan? Was this deviation when using a wide rigid cuff a cause for concern when using BFR? And you know, what we essentially found was during this very low intensity walking exercise, we had three conditions, a normal control with no bands or cuffs, what we called a narrow elastic condition, which we can talk about the specifics about the terminology here, and then a wide rigid cuff in the form of a Hokanson cuff to represent the wide rigid condition. And now we had sort of extreme versions of these things, you know, for the control, obviously, there was nothing on the limbs. For the narrow elastic, we 
went down to a, a relatively moderate level of pressure, you know, what might seem like a lot, 300 millimeters of mercury actually just represents the pressure within the band, not necessarily what is being placed on the limb. And then on the wide rigid cuff, we had a pressure of 160 millimeters of mercury, which was a relatively high pressure for this, for this wide rigid approach. And we did that to sort of not only delineate the differences, but we wanted to see sort of the, on the high end, what was the response to this wide rigid condition. And the idea was that with a wide rigid cuff, the muscle does not have as much room to expand into during a muscle contraction. And for those listeners out there, the muscle pump is very critical to the function of BFR as it makes sure that there is no stasis of flow, that the venous side of things is constantly being pumped out past the, the venous blockade. And so we were hypothesizing whether this rigid versus more elastic nature of the or characteristic of the cuff or band would have an impact on that. And what we found was that there was a, an elevated blood pressure response when doing this two minutes of walking at uh, about three miles an hour with a wide rigid cuff, but there was really no difference and actually a slight decrease in blood pressure as compared to control when using the narrow elastic cuffs. And we kind of hypothesized that there might be enhanced vasodilation going on when using a narrow elastic band, which is also likely happening with a wide rigid cuff. However, the lack of ability to have this venous outflow as readily as seen in a narrow elastic cuff may explain this increase in blood pressure, increase in heart rate as compared to the narrow elastic bands. Something else to mention here is that we saw an increase in rating of perceived exertion with the wide rigid cuffs, as well as an increase in lactate production with the wide rigid cuffs. So these things can sort of be interpreted. At one interpretation could be the stimulus for the narrow elastic bands were not sufficient to elicit the adaptations that we are shooting for. And maybe that slight elevation in blood pressure could be useful for healthy populations. Conversely, I think the RPE may have been affected by the pain response. So, you know, we got a lot of feedback saying this was not a very comfortable exercise where we didn't have that necessarily with the narrow elastic bands. And so, you know, our main conclusion was this wide rigid approach can be used in PT clinics and places in, in research settings where things are very tightly controlled and regulated and, th and you can actually go in with an ultrasound or check your pulse or have people around you who know what they're doing. But when we're going into the gym and performing these things on your own or without any medical supervision, or professional supervision, it might be better to use a narrow elastic cuff to sort of mitigate any risk of, of unwanted responses. To what extent do you think the wide cuff, say on the upper arm, impedes the critical pump. In other words, uh, depending on your size, a blood pressure cuff, a traditional blood pressure cuff is very big. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I've done it a few times and I have to say it's very uncomfortable, especially considering, you know, if you have a, someone who has a, a relatively small arm, you know, theoretically the, the cuff would be completely covering their bicep and their tricep. And so I, I, Quite honestly, I don't understand how you could really get a lot of pump in that right. muscle to begin with. And, you know, there have been some studies that looked at maybe a little bit of muscular change or change in muscular structure when using a wide rigid band just under the cuff, you know, and that, that might be going on. What I would say is that it is clear that this can be an effective form of training, but are there other either risks or trade-offs that you're, that you're accepting when you're using a wide rigid cuff. And this notion that it is the only safe and effective BFR uh, is certainly not true. Um, yeah. and, and that needs to be discussed more. Right. As you mentioned earlier in Japan, blood flow restriction training in the form of katsu has been in use with athletes. And as you said, even with senior citizens for a long time, well over 30 years. And as you noted, they've had a very low incidence of serious complications. So Katsu's been around a long time. I mean, I started using it, I think, in 2012 or around there, 2013 maybe. But I suspect that some of our listeners are quite unfamiliar with Katsu. And for those who are interested, I highly recommend that they listen to your father's 2016 interview where he talks quite a bit about Katsu. But for today's Sten, can you give listeners a brief history of Katsu, which really is, in a sense, the early history of blood flow restriction training? Yeah, you know, it's it's actually a very interesting story. Dr. Sato, who's really the inventor of BFR, was at a, attending a funeral service. And in this in this funeral service, they were sitting in a traditional seiza position, which is sort of uh, sitting on top of your heels with your knees bent. And, you know, he's also a bodybuilder. At the end of this, what we might 
call, you know, legs falling asleep. He actually noticed a slight difference and noticed that his calves were quite pumped, the same kind of pump that he could elicit in the gym. And this kind of got him thinking, kind of turned on the initial light bulb. He then went skiing at Mount Fuji and ended up having an injury where he was put into a full leg cast at the time. Now, after being in this full leg cast he, uh, and kind of having that epiphany, he realized that restricting blood flow might be advantageous to mitigating the atrophy normally associated with being in this sort of immobilized state. At six weeks, it was, it was common for them to go in and replace the cast. And when they did that, they actually noted a, a huge mitigation of the atrophy that they would normally expect. And they ended up taking the cast off and actually casting a very similar sized leg cast as a result. So, you know, it was this initial epiphany followed by, you know, personal experimentation and application, which was really the, the origin of BFR. And it must be noted, though, that he actually gave himself a pulmonary embolism at one point by going too far, by likely causing ischemia or likely having too high of a pressure where he was occluding at some level and performing exercise. And, and so it is, you know, within that same origin vein, it's important to, to, to note that this is not without risk and proper implementation is, is, is critical for the safe use of, of BFR. As a follow-up, they did a lot of studies or investigations looking at the incidence of serious complications. There is a low incidence of serious complications, but sort of some minor complications that are commonly seen is some lightheadedness just from the intensity of the exercise, some numbness or tingling in the fingertips or the toes which we can talk about some ways to mitigate that response, or even some, uh, some itchiness or sort of a histamine response within the skin I've seen before as well. And so, you know, these things are not something to be particularly worried about, but they are normal responses to, or normal in, uh, variable responses to BFR that should, you know, should be noted and uh, appease people's concerns when these things happen. But, you know, as a fundamental thing, the serious complications are very, very low. As a matter of fact, they did a study where they looked at the incidence of serious complications in 12,400 and something Japanese people, about a third of that cohort was hospitalized uh, at some point. And they had six cases of DVTs in that uh, just over 12,000 individuals, which was actually lower than the incidence of DVT in a clinical population. And so this is actually used as a way to prevent or mitigate cardiovascular issues in Japan today. And they actually perform it on the plane um, in some cases, or they have it as a uh, sort of, if you're diagnosed with a cardiovascular disease, they actually use it as a way to prevent further progression of disease in Japan. So certainly has the potential to cause serious complications if used incorrectly, but actually if, if implemented properly can actually help mitigate some aspects in the prevalence of cardiovascular disease. You know, it's always interesting to me how much of scientific direction is seeded by personal motivation. Uh, that's a great example of that. So back to your study, to determine the potentially different effects of the two forms of, of BFR training, you assess the hemodynamic responses of 15 young, healthy individuals during walking using either the wide, rigid cuffs or the narrow, elastic katsu bands. Can you talk about how you conducted the study and what you found? Yeah, and so just to reiterate, this was done about six years ago. We actually used the B-Strong bands as the narrow elastic condition and the Hokanson for the wide rigid cuffs. And again, as, as I kind of mentioned before, the main finding was that we had an elevated systolic blood pressure when using the wide rigid cuffs as compared to the narrow elastic bands and a higher degree of what we call myocardial oxygen demand, which is essentially a rate pressure product, heart rate times systolic blood pressure, which can kind of give an index of how hard the heart is working. And notably, we found a, a decrease, a slight decrease in blood pressure when using the narrow elastic bands, which was interesting and, and may point to, as I mentioned before, this, this increased enhanced vasodilation that's going on in the context of proper venous outflow. And so by doing so, not only are you mitigating potential risk for a cardiovascular event, but I also think that you are sort of filling in blood into the teleological nooks and crannies of the limb promoting blood flow in areas that would otherwise be very difficult to achieve. So that was one of the sort of nice little findings that, that we had that sort of pointed to maybe a, a relative risk assessment for when using wide rigid bands versus narrow elastic bands. I do have to say, obviously, there are limitations to this. We used young, healthy individuals, which do not necessarily, they could, but they do not necessarily translate to more clinical populations. So we really need to do those studies in those populations to see the exact effects. Absolutely. 
So in some ways, forms of BFR overlap, and in some ways they do not. Uh, I want to make a call for more specific terminology, as I've mentioned before, for the umbrella term of blood flow restriction. You know, while it appears that the effects on muscle st- size, strength, endurance, etc., might be similar, there are likely subtle differences regarding the vasculature, the rate of fiber recruitment, and really the possibilities of a variety of exercise performed. So you had a 2021 paper in the uh, European Journal of Surgical Oncology that's very interesting. You looked at the use of BFR training and nutrition as a way to improve the physical function in abdominal cancer patients who are awaiting surgery. So this was sort of a prehab approach. I'm curious about how this study came about. What led you to look at the unlikely field of sports science as a rehabilitation strategy for cancer patients? Yeah, this was a really fun study. I have to give credit to uh, Hiro Tanaka. He really wanted to take a coach's or sports scientist's approach to getting these uh, abdominal cancer patients ready for surgery. And a little bit of background here. Generally speaking, someone is diagnosed with an abdominal cancer, and four weeks from that point, they are scheduled for surgery if it's appropriate. And so, first of all, there's not a lot of turnover time as We know that it takes really six weeks to see any noticeable changes in muscle composition for the most part. Most of the increases in strength are going to be neurological or neuromuscular. And so there's not a a whole lot of time for turnaround as far as getting ready. But the the other side of this is increases in muscle mass are associated with reduced morbidity and mortality following cancer surgery. And so, again, the idea was to take this sort of sports scientist or coach's approach to help get these cancer patients ready for surgery. And so we implemented not only blood flow restriction, but we also gave them a sports nutrition cocktail of whey protein, creatine monohydrate, and L-citrulline to help supply nutrition for all of the work and exercise that they'd be doing. We had a four-week protocol with exercises five to six days per week alternating 45 minutes of BFR exercise or 15 minutes of walking. What happened is the participants came into the lab on four separate occasions to sort of familiarize themselves with BFR exercise. And I was a, a crucial piece of this, I sort of oversaw all of the BFR exercise implementation. And I do have to say that it was it was a really profound and awesome experience to work with these patients who, you know, not only had just been diagnosed with cancer, but were willing to go into a trial and perform exercise to get them ready for surgery. And I have many, many good stories about just their their perseverance and their attitude throughout this, this training session. And, you know, not only did we see significant differences in muscle composition, actually loss, a little bit of loss of body fat, improvements in aerobic measures such as the six-minute six walk test, the timed up and go, which is more of a power assessment, sit to stand time improvement. But we also saw a huge increase in mood and overall well-being, which cannot be overstated for this population who are sort of dealing with a very serious condition. You know, another another thread within this story is that this was uh, the same time that my father was diagnosed with cancer and uh, had been given a few weeks to get ready for his surgery. And so it was very cool to for him to apply his own methodology and the methodology that we were working with these participants to his own application and get ready for surgery. So it, on many levels, it was a very cool study and, and a really a crossover of this sports science approach with a very clinical application. I like it. Very nice. Please describe this interesting study structure. You, you talked about the study and the patient population and the goals. How was it structured? It seems like this was perhaps a tricky one. Yeah, you know, one limitation of this study was that we didn't have a proper control. Uh, <laughs> That's what I was dealing, wondering. <laughs> yeah, when, when you're dealing with this population, there's this intent to treat. Now, we knew that this would represent a positive benefit to these individuals. And so we really had an obligation to allow for each participant to undergo this potentially, you know, life-saving or functional saving prehabilitation prior to surgery. And so, you know, while it was not the squeaky clean research setup that that is, you know, preferred, I actually really enjoyed working with these these people and and allowing them to have hope in terms of their their prognosis and subsequent surgery. You know, one one thing to mention here is this is in a relatively sarcopenic group who were likely undergoing cachexia, uh, muscle wasting from the cancer itself. And although it might not seem like a lot, they gained about a kilo, a little bit less than a kilo of muscle lean mass, uh, hmm. and actually lost about a, uh, a little less than a kilo of fat mass. So in a four-week time period, that's actually pretty substantial. Now, it should it should be noted that the creatine and the whey protein were likely big players here in addition to the BFR exercise stimulus. 
but certainly the exercise was a major component as well. I can imagine. And, you know, one would hope a study like this would have a significant impact. It's, you can never tell. It's almost independent of how useful the outcome is, whether clinically it gets picked up much. Right. Let's talk a little bit about ischemic heart disease, which represents the most common form of cardiovascular disease. Essentially, ischemic heart disease refers to weakening of the heart caused by uh, constricted or reduced blood flow. Typically, this is the result of coronary artery disease, where one or more of the arteries has some plaque buildup and therefore flow is reduced. Treatments that restore blood flow to the heart can cause what is known as ischemia reperfusion injury. Uh, can you explain for listeners what an ischemia reperfusion injury is? Sure, yeah. You know, again, as you mentioned, sort of the typical scenario with a myocardial infarction is whether there was plaque in the coronary artery or downstream that ended up in the coronary artery to block flow, we cause ischemia or lack of flow, lack of oxygen. And this causes the heart muscle to, uh, which is heavily aerobic muscle fiber, to uh, start to die. Um, and become sort of cut off from its from its nutrients and ability to contract as it should. And, you know, it's funny, as you mentioned, it's not necessarily this ischemia that is so damaging to the vessel, but it's the reperfusion of flow. And what happens there is that during this ischemic event, we have in a huge increase in oxidative stress. And then now when you go and release that blockage, you have this reperfusion of highly oxidative um, stress that sort of augments that that stress and causes inflammation and injury to the vessel. And so this is a major issue with myocardial infarction and coronary artery disease in general. And so there are various techniques that have been hypothesized and implemented to help mitigate this oxidative stress response. So you were part of a study that led to a 2021 paper, Journal of Applied Physiology. You and your colleagues looked at intermittent hypoxia as a potential systemic strategy to prevent the reduction in flow-mediated dilation following ischemia reperfusion injury, which you just talked about. Can you give listeners an overview of intermittent hypoxia in this context? Yeah, so intermittent hypoxia sort of represents a systemic level of hypoxia or hypoxemia. So when we talk about blood flow restriction in the hypoxia, we're really talking about the tissues. The, the tissues become hypoxic, low oxygen levels. But in hypoxemia, it's actually the blood that becomes lower in oxygen saturation. This is the same sort of systemic hypoxemia that you experience when you go up to altitude. Intermittent hypoxia is short duration of exposure to hypoxia that elicits a drop in oxygen saturation. And we think of this as sort of these small acute exposures as potentially beneficial for the cardiovascular system to then tolerate further increases in stress. And so intermittent hypoxia has taken sort of many forms. We used an eight by four minute protocol towards the end. I believe in this study, we used a three by four minute intermittent hypoxia protocol, which is four minutes of breathing nitrogen rich hypoxic air separated by breathing room air to allow sort of resaturation and in that way, you're sort of doing interval training as far as the protocol is concerned, but you're specifically titrating in nitrogen to reduce the oxygen concentration. That's really interesting stuff. So this hypoxic preconditioning that you just sort of introduced us to had some protective effects against ischemia reperfusion, which was actually quite noteworthy. Can you talk about the significance of the study? Sure. You know, it's important to mention the idea of ischemic preconditioning, which is sort of related to BFR, where you use cuffs and you completely occlude the artery. You you make it you make the limb ischemic. You have it on for a period of four to five minutes, four to six minutes, I should say, and then you release the cuff, allow for flow to continue, and then you repeat this process. And so we sort of use that same model, but had a more systemic application in this this intermittent hypoxia, and so we called it hypoxic preconditioning. Now we didn't look at any mechanistic aspects underlying the response here. But the idea was that you were favorably altering this nitric oxide reactive oxygen species balance, which is critical to maintain proper blood flow and mitigate any damage. And so the idea was through this intermittent exposure, this acute exposure to stress, we primed or preconditioned the endothelium and the vasculature to handle excessive increases in oxidative stress that's associated with this ischemia reperfusion injury. Now, we didn't use the heart as an index. Uh, that's be a, a bit unethical. We actually used the brachial artery 
So we induced uh, an ischemia reperfusion injury. This is actually a, a crossover study where on one visit, the person underwent hypoxic preconditioning. On the second visit, that same individual or second, it, we randomized it as well. But on either visit, they had either the hypoxia or the pneumoxia condition. And we preceded this ischemia reperfusion injury, which was elicited by inflating a blood pressure cuff on the upper arm to 250 millimeters of mercury, which completely occluded the arm for 20 minutes. And this was shown to decrease endothelial function. We used flow-mediated dilation to assess endothelial function in the brachial artery. So it reduced flow-mediated dilation uh, in the normoxia group. It also reduced the flow-mediated dilation in the hypoxia group, but this was mitigated by about 50%. And so while there was still evidence of ischemia reperfusion injury, it was mitigated by this preconditioning with intermittent hypoxia. It's kind of amazing, really, if you think about it, with just one preconditioning exposure. It really is. And we, we were quite shocked, to be honest. You know, we, we hypothesize these things will happen. And actually, in this lab, we had a uh, previous master's student do this in young, healthy individuals. My paper was done in clinical uh, or older adults, I should say, not clinical, who are at higher risk of a cardiovascular event. And we actually saw a more profound effect in this in the older adults, which was quite substantial and can be applied to clinical applications now. Uh, you know, one one thing to mention here is there's some work by Dr. Trumbauer at Harvard looking at intermittent hypoxia and its effects on neuroplasticity, specifically motor neuroplasticity, which I think has some really interesting effects as well. I think more, more work needs to be done there to look at the effects of intermittent hypoxia to improve, in this case, gait function in partial spinal cord injury patients who have problems with ambulation. Mm. Um, so there's different applications for this intermittent hypoxia. It's of great interest to me. It's sort of along the same lines as blood flow restriction in sort of the hypoxia umbrella. And there may be something profound to this hypoxic stimulus. Marcus, I know that you've always uh, sort of coined the idea of acute stress resulting in more chronic benefits versus chronic stress leading to pathological conditions. And I think that's very much at play here. Yeah, I agree. You've recently taken a postdoc position at the University of South Carolina in the sports science lab under Dr. Sean Arndt. How did that come about? Uh, what was the connection there? Yeah, so, you know, uh, funny story. Dr. Sean Arndt had just had surgery on his neck uh, and was using BFR to help rehab from that, from that surgery. Hopefully not uh, on his neck. No, not on his neck. That's actually a <laughs> no, good point I'm, I'm to kidding. make. <laughs> this was a, uh, a proximal application to distal BFR, right? But no, he, and he had a great success. Uh, we have very, very quickly. He's, he's sort of a, a specimen in and of itself. So we weren't too surprised that he was able to rehab so quickly. But no doubt, blood flow restriction had a big impact on that. And in that time, he was sort of in contact with my dad and as he was sort of prescribing the, the BFR application. And Dr. Sean Arndt comes at various problems with a endocrinology lens and uses a lot of biomarkers in a sports performance application to, to understand exactly where that athlete is in their training um, and how it's reflecting in, in their biomarkers. And so I really wanted to understand that to a deeper level. Um, I'd, I'd been well-trained in sort of the vascular side of things and wanted to expand my interest and expand my repertoire to understand the underlying physiology at play. And I do think that there's this endocrine response elicited with BFR so that's kind of what brought me here is I wanted to sort of expand um, and, and really get to the bottom of what exactly is going on from an endocrine, endocrine level with BFR. It sounds like a great opportunity for you as a postdoc. Can you talk a little bit about the projects in the sports science lab that you'll be undertaking? Yeah, so I, like I said, I got here in August. So it's been a lot of grant writing so far and kind of trying to identify a potential project to work on. So I haven't had my own project to work on quite yet. We've worked with a couple, uh, looking at the effects of a couple different supplements that are kind of impressed, can't really talk about them quite yet. We also applied for a, a grant looking at a cocktail of supplements, which is kind of all I can really say at this point. But certainly there are some things in the pipeline regarding BFR, just briefly, whether things should be periodized, what the impact of low intensity versus a little bit higher intensity BFR application could elicit. That's kind of as, as kind of surface level as I can, as I can mention or as deep as I can go on those projects currently, but certainly a lot to be discovered and a lot to be tested out with regards to BFR and its impact on, on biomarkers. Well, best of success with the grant applications, and uh, Thank I'm you. sure you're going to have an enriching postdoc. Uh, let's talk a little bit about how people can actually get into BFR training. Can you give the listeners an idea of the specialized cuffs or bands? We've talked a lot about those, but you know, 
where to get them, how to use them. Sure. You know, in full disclosure here, Be Strong is a family company. It was started by my dad, which is really, you know, just to take a slight deviation, it's it's been a very cool culmination of an engineering process and a physiological process kind of coming together uh, with my dad sort of understanding the efficacy side and the safety side of things. And then Sean Whalen and his father, Rob Whalen, sort of understanding the engineering side of things. And it was a very nice melding of minds to, to come out with the Be Strong product, which can sort of be categorized as a semi-elastic compressive cuff. And so what's really interesting about them is that as you start out with no air pressure in the band, they are relatively inelastic. As soon as you actually inflate the band with air, all of a sudden it becomes this sort of semi-elastic band, which is really the the sort of middle ground that you want when you're employing BFR. You want to be able to restrict venous flow adequately without affecting arterial flow, and you want to allow the muscle to expand to a point to allow the muscle pump to function. And so, you know, obviously that's what I would recommend as far as a BFR product. Although, as as I've mentioned before, there are other cases where BFR can be very effective uh, using different types. What I would advise against is uh, something that is particularly narrow, like a like a rubber band or even a resistance band. These things can sort of put undue pressure on underlying nerves and things like that that may not be great and cause numbness and tingling when it's not necessary. And so really the the fundamental purpose of, of Be Strong was to come up with a product that was feasible, practical, and as not uncom- not as uncomfortable as possible. <laughs> what I mean by that is, you know, there's a certain degree of discomfort associated with muscle burn, but the attempt was to try to mitigate the mechanical compression and the pain experience with the mechanical compression when using BFR. So with all that being said, um, these were made to make them as safe and as comfortable as possible while still maintaining the proper and appropriate pressure of venous occlusion, intermittent venous occlusion, to elicit the, the benefits of BFR training. Sten, I have to say, I ran across some videos of BFR training that you did with Kathy Smith, Mm. popular personal training instructor. She became quite well known in the 80s and 90s for workout videos and so forth. She's now in her 70s and is still quite active and fit. Did a series of videos with you demonstrating how to use B-Strong bands for blood flow restriction training. And watching that video of the two of you doing 15 burpees, I have to say she hung in there. Uh, Sure did. And, you know, she's pretty incredible, isn't she? She's, she's awesome. Uh, it's, it was a pleasure to work with her. And, and actually, to your point, BFR can kind of be used as the ultimate equalizer. I can tell you those burpees were pretty hard for me as well. And Kathy is, is uh, an exceptional. I can't believe she's 70, year old, 70 years old. I, I, would, I would expect her to be 15 years younger. But it was awesome to work with her. And she's been a huge proponent of BFR. And if you listen to her, it's really changed her life as far as allowing her to get to the point where she can actually adapt um, and stimulate benefits to her aerobic and uh, muscle mass. Speaking of Kathy, I don't think she is going to fall victim to sarcopenia anytime soon. No. (laughs) As you said, she's 70 years old. And most seniors would be well advised to follow Kathy's lead and consider at least taking up blood flow restriction training. It's sort of ideal for the senior population. Your father, when he was on the podcast back in 2017, he actually described blood flow restriction training as a godsend in his words for baby boomers. He was encouraging seniors to take up blood flow restriction to prevent sarcopenia. You know, lots of seniors have compromised joints. For example, Mm. I have terrible shoulders. And, um, you know, it seems particularly appropriate for that population. Any thoughts on this? Absolutely. Uh, you know, Dr. Sato and, and my father, for that matter, always purported BFR as anti-aging medicine. You know, exercise is such a powerful tool in the proverbial handbook to be able to expand the health span. As you well know, there's not much we can do about the lifespan for the most part, but expanding the health span should be a primary focus. And blood flow restriction training, whether it's for uh, a resistance uh, application or an aerobic application, can help mitigate the effects of aging and allow people to exercise at an intent at a relative intensity that actually elicits changes and and, and beneficial um, changes to their physiology. So and you know, so with that, maybe we could go into a couple of different protocols that I'd recommend for people to try out. Absolutely. Fire away. So you know, typically the again from the origin on um, there was this three by thirty reps scheme where you do three sets of thirty reps with about thirty seconds to a minute in between each set. I do enjoy this protocol, especially if you're dealing with 
very, very light loads. There has been other forms, other protocols, the 30, 15, 15, 15 approach, which has sort of been popularized in recent years. I also like that one because not only are you reducing the number of reps on those on those three sets, which is a little bit more mentally tolerable, counting to 90 sometimes is difficult, but you also sort of extend and approach, approach that asymptote of fatigue. You know, the, again, the, the primary perfect purpose of blood flow restriction is to increase the a rapid onset of fatigue. And that fatigue is sort of that zone of proximal development that is necessary to elicit adaptation. So any way to get there is is great. I've also played with, in particular for aerobic type exercise, just going for time. So, you know, on the first set, you go for 45 seconds to a minute, the rest 30 to 45 seconds, and then you do three to four sets of 30 second bouts. And that seems to be pretty beneficial for, again, the aerobic side of things, but also on the muscle side of things. And so you don't have to necessarily worry about the number of reps. You're just going, uh, you're performing an exercise for a given amount of time. And that can be particularly useful for people if they're traveling or if they just want to change up and add some variety into their, into their training session. No, that's great. That's a great summary and good recommendations. Uh, Stan, this has been great fun. Congratulations again on completing your doctorate. Best of success on your new role at South Carolina. Thank you so much. It's been an honor and a privilege to speak on the STEM talk. Uh, it's not lost on me. The the uh, uh, the STEM on STEM talk was pretty <laughs> funny. My family had a nice little laugh at that, and it's particularly special for for me to to be on here after you know the passing of my father and him being on this uh, six years ago. He spoke so highly of of both of you, uh, and uh, just really an honor to be on here and uh, and in memory of him. Well, thank you, Sten, and you did a great job. Your father would be proud. Absolutely. Thank you. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. I hope today's interview with Sten convinced some of our listeners to give BFR training a try. And Ken, I know you've been using BFR for quite some time, haven't you? Yes, indeed. I've been an ardent user of blood flow restriction training since about 2012 or 2013, and I highly recommend it. If you enjoyed this interview as much as Ken and I did, we invite you to visit the STEM Talk webpage where you can find the show notes for this and all other episodes at stemtalk.us. This is Marcus Bauman signing off for now. And this is Ken Ford saying goodbye until we meet again on STEM Talk. Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. We want this podcast to be discovered by others. So please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There, you can also find more information about the guests we interview.